Baby dolls. Hi, baby dolls. What's going on with you on this Friday? This Friday, September 22nd, 2023. Um, this has been a better week than last week. It really has for me. And I really feel like that lends credence to my theory that my moroseness last week was from my period, my menstrual cycle. I'm not sure. And we're going to be tracking, you know, the data on this. And I'm going to see where I am emotionally next time I start my period, which generally is like every 27 days. So it is a moon cycle. Okay. That's what I think. And we should be honoring that. And so I'm going to try to honor that. Although there's this one nourish your cycle Instagram account, which is really good, but just, I cannot be that disciplined about the food that I put in my mouth because of my period. And maybe they would be less painful. I don't know. Maybe I would have been fertile instead of having to really get my thyroid squared away before I got pregnant, whatever. I don't know. I have no idea. But anyway, I don't know. We'll see. The menstrual cycle is a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a lot for a long time. I can't wait for menopause. Anyway, I hope everyone's ha had a good week. If you haven't, whatever. It, you know, sometimes they suck and that's okay too. Uh, I wanted to give everyone a quick update on the turkey vulture episode that I was talking about on Monday when, when the turkey vulture was eating the possum carcass on my neighborhood street and everyone was slowing down for it. And I was wondering like, how in the hell can a turkey vulture from so far away come and find a possum carcass that like blends into the road and is under trees and all that stuff. And my sister who cited David Attenborough as her source, who knows if that's true or not. I don't know, but that's what she said. Um, said that turkey vultures have the keenest sense of smell in of like the birds or one of the keenest sense of smell, like the, a, a very keen sense of smell, comparatively speaking, in the bird kingdom, and they can smell a rotting carcass from far away. So that's pretty awesome. Circle of life. Hashtag, you know, so good job. My sister coming through on that fax. And so now we understand why turkey vultures can do miraculous and amazing things from far away. Also, I wanted to give a shout out this Friday to maternity bras. You guys, I have biddies. I have tiggle biddies. I've had them since sixth grade. And I hate underwire. The underwire is a form of torture for me. And I refuse. I don't care. I will wear underwire if I'm going to a formal event. And I only have to wear that bra for like three hours. And... I have hated underwire for a thousand million years and I've avoided them like the plague for over a decade, more than a decade because my oldest is 13 now and I stopped, I mean, I don't know, they suck. They absolutely suck. I think the only people who might enjoy underwires are small breasted women. And if you have small breasts, I, man, I envy you. I envy. I'm jealous of you. I'm super jealous of you. And I'm super jealous of anyone who has the boobs that where you don't have to wear a bra and you can just go around and not have a bra and everything because I could, you know, the pencil test where like if your boobs touch the skin, like under your thing and you can hold a pencil there, then you need a bra. Like I could hold a whole pack of pencils, man. I could hold a pocket protector and, um, and I can't stand not having them supported. So I need a bra, but I want a comfortable bra that I can wear all day. And I stumbled into maternity bras. Now I wore maternity bras, but I don't mean nursing bras, which is different where they unhitch and let your boob out and you can feed your kid. I wore those, but these are maternity bras that aren't nursing bras. And they're like, this one's like bravado and it's got mesh up top and I really like it. Oh my God, I really like it. Like I can wear it all day. It's pretty comfortable. And so it's like, okay, I understand that you just had a baby, but you're not entitled to the only, like to all, to have the bras with no underwire, like the rest of us who either didn't have kids or had kids long ago and need comfortable bras. You guys check out the maternity bras recommendation. So I just have to say that because I like to share the wealth if I find something nice. Also, another recommendation I have to say is that Instagram is not the total hellscape that Twitter is. I've been off Twitter for a while and every now and then I try to get back on and I can't do it. And so, but Instagram can super like still fuck with your energy and your soul and your spirit. So I do try and stay off it, but it is miraculous for one thing or for multiple things. But the one thing that I've been using it for that really saves me is for meal ideas. Like all the little cooks and chefs, even the home ones on Instagram, and I save them. And then when I have to like meal plan for these children, I only have one who who is like a spectacular trier of new foods. 
But um, if I have to have ideas, I go on I go on my saved Instagram videos, and there are a lot of good little Instagram chefs, you know. And some of these people have made a career out of it. I don't know. So anyway, I'm gonna do the broccoli cheddar soup from Chef Quiche, K E Y S H. I think it's Chef Quiche. I love his videos and um, Maxie's Kitchen, M A X I S Kitchen. She's a Korean chef, I believe, or a Korean cook. I don't know if she's a chef or a cook, but her stuff is so good. And anyway, so she did this Trader Joe's wonton soup. And when my mom comes next week, we're going to do that. I'm going to do that because I love a good wonton soup. And it has mushrooms in it. Like, it's got stuff in it. It's not just like broth and wontons. So we're going to try that. I'm also I'm pretty excited about that. Also, I just want to say, it is ridiculous how expensive school photos are. Now, they've always been, especially senior photos. Annette, I'm going to bring that up. But senior photos have always been expensive. But regular school photos, what the hell? What the hell? I found the secret, the secret to getting inexpensive school photos a few years ago when I just ordered the digital print. And I swear to God, I think three years ago, I paid $22 for a digital print of my child. You know what it is this year? You know what the, the digital print costs this year? $55. $55. $55. $55 for a freaking digital photo of my child. When I can create my own digital photos for nothing. So anyway, I don't know what's going on. I know that everything costs more and it's a lot to take photos of all these kids. That's the other thing is like they have fall photos now and spring photos and the class photo. Are you kidding me? It's... The whole thing is out of control. It's completely crazy. And the thing is, I'm not going to pay at all. So the school photo people, you should have made it a reasonable, I mean, I probably would have even forked over $30 for a digital photo of my kid, but $55, hella fucking no. What are you thinking? Who did that? Why did you do that? I don't get it. No, not doing it. And I know things are expensive and you gotta pay people. It's too, like, no. $55, no, absolutely fucking lutely not ridiculous. Okay, speaking of absolutely fucking lutely not, I listened to my last um, podcast and I realized that I was dropping F bombs a lot. So I just want to say here if you are new to the agentic feminine and you're new to me, um, then I'm a salty lady. I like salty language. I like cursing. I like curse words. I love them. I love language. I'm a big fan of curse words and I love saying them. I love the way they make me feel. Uh, smarter people tend to use that fuck word. You know who I listened to the other day talking about how she was dropping F-bombs is Judy Gold. I love her podcast, Kill Me Now, and she was talking about it too. And you know what? Fuck them. We're going to cuss. If you don't like cussing, then don't listen to us. Mark Maron cusses all the time. Love him. Emma Thompson, who's one of my heroes, talks about how she loves cursing. So, you know, I did a whole essay on profanity in my The Agentic Feminine community online on MightyNetwork.com. Shout out. Go ahead and join it. And I did a little essay on it because what is dubbed profanity by a white supremacist patriarchy is generally um, anything that can empower oppressed cultures and anything that helps you express your anger because anger is a tool for change. So a lot of things that we would do when we're angry are then shamed, which is how they are that which is how they are then made to be profane. How the culture, you know, creates a shade of profanity on something is generally something that empowers people to change the culture and things that help you express your anger change culture. And so the power infrastructure doesn't like that. So they dub it profane. And when you dub it profane, you make it culturally unpopular. So that if I'm doing something profane, then even the people around me will shame me in back into this box or this lane so that we can just, you know, keep the whole narrative going and keep the current culture in place. So my suggestion is to embrace profanity, understand it's a tool, and whatever they say is profane, do a fucking lot cuss a lot, show your titties a lot, like whatever they think is profane, they only think is profane because it threatens their hold on power. So jump in, cannonball into the profanity, the more the better, do it. Although, although I don't know what to do with my kids because they're getting to that age where they're testing the limits with profanity and crassness and I don't know what to do with it. I just don't know. Like, I want to accept it. But I also feel like, listen, 
profanity and crassness is something you need to do. Like I'm all for kids doing it when their parents can't hear. Like that's what I did. It's a really good way, I think, to, you know, like, you know, do a little um, rebellion against your parents. And my kid the other day goes, oh, I need to take a piss. And he's 11. And I was like, ugh. So I'm all for profanity and I'm all for me being profane and I'm all for everyone being profane and like relishing in their profanity. But when it's my own kids, it makes me uncomfortable, you know. And anyway, I don't really punish them for profanity ever. In fact, punishing is a whole different thing. But I don't necessarily like scold them or correct them too much. And I tell them like at school... I'm like, I don't know, you know, it all depends on the situation. If you use it, you know, if they're defending themselves, I'll back them up. But like, if they're just, you know, if they're going to get, I'm like, you know, if you're going to get in trouble at school, you're going to get in trouble at school and you're going to have to eat it. I don't know. Cause I'm not going to sit there and like go to war with the school so that kids can drop F-bombs. But I don't know. The line with profanity with children is really hard. I haven't decided what to do. I don't know that I'll ever have decided. I just hope that we get to adulthood, their adulthood without it being a big thing. Okay, without it ever being a big thing where I don't have to take like a real strong stance or make any decisions. I could just be really wishy-washy about it and my kids can just figure it out for themselves, right? Because that's how you parent. That's a really good way to parent. That's just what I'm hoping for is just to kind of skate, just kind of skate through. Although I do teach them about the cultural implications of profanity and what it means. And we do really talk a lot about what is profane versus what is a pejorative. You know, like words that are labels that are used to um, keep people out of the power infrastructure of heteronormative white males. So the words like bitch, cunt, twat, as, you know, using the feminine genitalia as a pejorative, um, and then other words that, that label people's ethnicity, their ability, all those kinds of things, and I tell kids why those are pejoratives and why we don't use those. That's a different thing than profanity. Anyway, okay, done with that TED Talk. I'm, gonna do, I'm done with that TED Talk. But the other thing I wanted to talk about this Friday, which is a happy, which is a happy topic, okay? It's a happy topic I've been really trying to be in the present and be uh, appreciative and grateful of what I have now, even though things are hard because I'm going through this divorce and trying to turn the, the rest of my life into what the life that I want it to be. And one of the things that I have to keep remembering is all the things that I get to do and will get to do now that I'm divorced. Things that I didn't get to do in my marriage and celebrate them and celebrate them consciously and talk about them. So there are a lot of things that I will get to do that I could have done in my marriage if it had been, if I had been willing to go through the fight of it. There are a lot of fights that I won and a lot of, you know, just pushing him it, to get what I wanted. Like if I needed a cabinet or if I needed, I mean, these are not like frivolous things. So much of what I wanted to do or wanted to have or buy or do for the kids, I had to like push through his def like defenses. And one of the things that I like, like if you want something or you don't want something, I get that. But I don't, not everything needs to be a fight. Like if everything's a fight, then we're fucking incompatible. And the better, the sooner that we recognize that, the better. So a lot of things that I'm going to say, like, I'm so excited I get to do this. You're like, well, you could be asking Meredith, why didn't you do this before? And I get it. And I could have, I could have fought my way into these things, but the psychological weight of that is so heavy and you're already trying to cope with financial instability, professional instability, problems with your kids, like getting, making sure your kids are okay, getting them to eat nutritious things. Like you're already carrying so much weight, you know, dealing with social, like in this American life that then having to fight for shit, you just end up letting things go. I mean, that's the whole the running with the wolves is that you just you end up letting parts of yourself be killed off because it's too heavy. It's too heavy to keep fighting. And so you let it go. Well, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to. I've, I am on the other side. I am officially divorced and I can do things. 
And so the things that I'm really excited to do, A, number one, are traveling. I want to travel. I want to do lots of traveling and I want to do lots of traveling with my kids. And I want to do lots of taking them on trips and showing them places and getting VRBOs in Costa Rica for the summer and or Ireland and going to, you know, and going to places where you have to travel by plane or you have to travel by train and not having to deal with someone's shit attitude about having to be in an airport or whatever, you know, and not not that the attitudes were shitty all the time, but like you know, one of the things that we really enjoyed when we were married was going to Vegas. We loved Vegas, but we always went to Vegas. Like, we didn't go to Miami. We didn't go to New York City. We didn't go to these other places. And I always wondered, like, why are we just going to Vegas? And I think it was because we just wanted to go on a trip and we knew Vegas and it was easy. Like, when I go to the Vegas airport, I feel at home. Like, I feel like, okay, I'm home. You know, it's my other home, but it's home. And I'm like, we are, we've been, we've been to Vegas too much if I feel like I'm at home at the Vegas airport. And I do love me some Vegas. I do. But I want variety in trips and I want to see the world. And I'm a traveler. And I, you know, I did my year abroad in France. And each semester with the school, we went on this major tour. And like the first semester, and by the way, yes, I went into a lot of debt for this. But the first semester we did Western Europe and the second semester we did Eastern Europe. And it was phenomenal. I've been over much of the European continent and it was life changing. I mean, I'm a completely different person than I would have been if I didn't, if I hadn't done that. And so anyway, traveling was a bitch. It was a bitch and it was all my responsibility during my marriage. And now maybe it's all my responsibility now, but now there's not this heaviness of like dealing with people's bad attitude or at least my bitterness that I'm having do I'm the one having to do everything. So Super excited about all the traveling that will be happening. Um, the other thing I'm excited about is being outdoorsy. And people are like, oh, I didn't know you were outdoors. Well, no shit. You didn't know I was outdoors because it was too fucking hard when I was married to be outdoorsy. I'm an outdoorsy person. I like camping. I like hiking. I like wilderness. I like cabins. I like grime and getting dirty and, and you know, fishing and playing in lakes and I like that, that all that. I want to be part of nature. We are of nature. And I feel like I've been suffocated because I haven't been outdoors. So I'm super, super, super excited to be outdoorsy. Okay. We went camping. We went camping when we were still dating. You know, we were actually together for five and a half years before we got married. And we went camping. And I brought this big tent. And it was pre-kids. And we were still like in our young party drinking phase. And we went camping. And I go to set up the tent. And he doesn't help me at all with this tent. And not only does he not help me, but because our friends assumed that he was going to be the one setting up the tent because he was the male, they pranked him by hiding the sticks that go in the little slots for your tent. They were hiding the sticks. And so I couldn't believe it because I knew that like everything, when I brought the tent, like everything was, and I, and I was looking around forever, forever. I was searching for the sticks for the tent and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I was about to give up when we were all, and we were all pretty wasted. And my drunk friends finally realized, oh shit, Meredith's trying to put the tent together, not him. And they gave me the damn sticks for the tent. Then I didn't put the cover on, you know, the rain cover. I didn't put the rain cover on and because I was drunk. And I put together a really big tent all by myself, drunk. And by the way, our other huge, massive guy friend, Chad, he didn't help me put the tent together either. And he slept in the tent with us. So it was like two big dudes and me. And I put the tent together. So in the morning, I am feeling this rain and mist on my face. And I'm like, what the hell? And I swear to God, Thank God I'm Cajun and I grew up in Texas because I let those two males who were like toasted and hung over and three sheets to the wind, but it was like morning time. And I threatened them within an inch of their life if those two did not get up and put the rain cover over the tent because it was like had an opening, you know, to air out the tent. There was an opening up the top. Like the top was not... You know, it was like mesh or something like that let the, and let the rain in. And I let those two fuckheads know that if they didn't get out and put that rain cover on, like their lives were going to be cut short. Like we were not going to leave the campsite with the same number of people that came to the campsite. And they did. 
got, you know, God love them. They, but they got up there and put that rain cover on. Anyway, I love being outdoorsy. I wasn't able to be outdoorsy when I was married and I'm really excited to be outdoorsy soon. Hopefully when we move, we'll really start getting out and kayaking and paddleboarding on lakes and camping and hiking and doing it all and having a good time. I cannot wait. You guys, I don't think, I don't know that this can even be qualified by words or quantified. I cannot describe I cannot describe how excited I am to decorate my own house, to put my own house together aesthetically and functionally, and to not have to check with anyone, not have to ask what anyone else wants to do, not have to take anyone else's taste into account. I mean, my kids can be in charge of their own rooms, but let me tell you what, this house is going to be mine. I'm going to organize it the way that my whole system and my like undiagnosed ADHD works. It is going to be like you know, like the Millennium Falcon, or it's going to be like the star, the enterprise or whatever. Like it is going to be a ship that we, where we are going to travel through the cosmos coming alive and being functional. And I'm going to be a ninja assassin of a household CEO who moms and puts her and gets her career where it wants to be. So I'm going to decorate it in a way that makes my soul come alive and makes me feel like like I'm so glad when I get home. I'm in my energy. I'm in my space. I am going to set it up exactly the way I want to set it up. I'm going to set it up. I'm going to buy whatever the hell I want to buy. I'm not going to worry about who thinks what about what cost and who thinks what about purples and pinks. Not that he ever said anything about purples and pinks. But before I put everything through the filter of what I thought he would like. You know what I mean? Like I would go to Ikea because Ikea has a lot of straight lines and dot and dots. You know, they're very geometrical. I'm much more of like a, like an abstract or a flowy type person, you know, and he is an engineer anyway. So I'm so excited, excited, excited to do a house my way, functionally, aesthetically for my thriving, for me to thrive. And for me to mom and parent and and help my kids thrive. I'm so damn excited for that. I'm still in the, our house of mar our marital home. But there will come a day soon when we are no longer in our marital home. And I will rock and roll. One of the reasons I don't do a lot of a lot more reels is because I don't want to do I don't want to do a reel from my like my marital home. I don't want that energy on my on my Insta feed. So I have like these like backgrounds that I bought, which I don't, he was not thrilled with when I started getting those. That was pre-divorce filing. And, but I'm not, I just don't feel like doing a lot of reels from our home. I want to do reels from my home. And I'm, and I'm so pumped. Okay, next thing that I'm pumped about. So if you're getting, going through divorce, like let's celebrate this. Let's celebrate all the shit that we can do now that we couldn't do then. Um, I'm excited for a fresh start. I'm really excited for a fresh start. And what I mean by that is socially. I'm really excited to be in a place where people don't associate me with him. Even last week, someone was telling me a story about something he did. And then, and people were, you know, that they weren't thrilled with. Like, and I don't fucking care. Like, I don't want to know. I don't give a shit. And frankly, in that instance, I would have had his back because I think that he was probably, he might have overreacted, but he was overreacting to someone who didn't do something right, in my opinion. And so I have to, like, and here's the thing, like, you know, anyway, uh, I don't, you know, I want to protect his privacy and I don't want to say too much about his behavior and why our marriage totally broke up. I do want to talk about divorce and I do want to normalize when people are incompatible, but that doesn't mean that I just need to like drag out a bunch of complaints about his behavior, but I don't want to be associated with his behavior anymore. I don't want to be associated with his decisions. I don't want to have to pay the social cost of his decisions. I don't want his ether and my ether to be mixed and for people to think of us as a unit. And here, I think that, I think that, you know, and I know that I can't let the, what people think of me and external factors determine my happiness. And so let me be clear, I'm not letting it determine my happiness, but I'm so excited for people to just know me as me, for people to know Meredith as Meredith, like divorced, single mom, you know, and that I am like emotionally, um, calm, like I'm fierce and I can, you know, I can defend some people and I can do what I need to do. I can do what I need to do. 
I can set boundaries. I can assert my opinion. I can defend my kids. I can help change culture. Like I can do those things, but I'm also um, relatively logical and relatively emotionally regulated and trustworthy. I want people, that's how I want to go through this world. I want to go through this world as as Meredith, not as Meredith and so-and-so, not as someone's wife and someone who has to carry that weight, someone who has to go to the office fucking Christmas parties, someone who has to bring the kids to the office and make sure the kids are well-behaved and make sure the kids are well, so that they can meet the coworkers and the bosses and all that crap. Like, I don't want to be their diplomat. I don't want to be their lady in waiting. I want to be me and Meredith and my person and my, you know, unique self and not be associated with this other person and not be that person's wife. I don't want that identity. I don't. So anyway, looking forward to those. All that said, and I'm going to keep talking about divorce because clearly this is a stage of life I'm in and we need to talk about divorce more. We need to talk about it in very, the the reality of it, how hard it is, but how awesome it is too. Because people get really scared, you know, when it when it's that time, when it's the time to call time on a relationship. It is so scary. So I think a lot of us that have been through it, the more that we can say, well, this is what I'm looking forward to and this is what's really awesome about it, the more that we'll help other women through it. So the one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to invade privacy. I don't want to reveal things that are not mine to reveal. So I do want to share my emotional response to certain things, but I want to respect boundaries and respect relationships you know we are all very complicated and messy people all humans are complicated and messy and that's okay i'm complicated and messy too the one thing that i have learned is that i am responsible for my pain i'm responsible for my unhealed trauma so i don't go and bleed all over other people and i don't trigger people's emotional states i don't put them on high alert i don't um Put them into a reactive state, you know, and I'm not in, con- I'm not in charge of how they respond. I'm not in charge of other people's emotional response to me, but I am in charge of whether or not I'm basically assaulting people, whether it's emotionally or just with my behavior. And so I'm responsible for my behavior. And that means other people are responsible for theirs. And So we're all complicated, we're all messy, we're all carrying pain, but we're all gonna get through this together. And, but we're gonna have fun too. And we're going to, um, we're gonna rock and roll. I mean, that's what this next age in my life is about. (sighs) You know, it's about breathing and letting it all go and rocking and rolling and, and living the life that I want to live true to myself, not having to give a crap about anybody's idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasies, about their bags of hammers that they're carrying, about their unhealed shit about their messes that they're making, expected me to clean up. I don't have to be anybody's lady in waiting. I don't have to be anybody's personal assistant and domestic goddess. Like I don't have to be any fucking shit like that. This is my time. This is my life. I'm not married anymore. I get to do this. I get to do this my way. It's hella fucking awesome. And and I'm gonna be shouting it from the rooftops. I'm gonna be dancing naked in the moonlight on the top of my house, which is not true. I'm not going to do that even a little because for a Jesus with the asphalt, have you got, or not asphalt, what is it? The shingles are so rough. I put Christmas lights up one year and I was scooching with pants that I really liked. I was scooching on my butt, putting these Christmas lights up and I tore a big old hole in my ass. I had no idea that my pants had the biggest hole ever. And then I got down and those lights stayed up forever because he would not get up and help me with the lights. He wouldn't get on the roof and fix them. He wouldn't do any of that. So he wasn't helpful in that way. And those lights stayed up and then COVID started. And remember when COVID first started and everyone put their Christmas lights out to celebrate, or at least they did in my neighborhood a lot, not everyone, but a lot of people put their Christmas lights up. And it was so convenient because my Christmas lights were still up. And my Christmas lights stayed up for so long that the squirrels chewed through them and destroyed them and then they were scattered all over the roof but he had gone to California and I didn't want to get up on the roof 
because I'm a single mom here, people, and I didn't want to endanger myself because I'm the only parent around. So if I fall off the roof, like my kids are screwed. So the so the lights were hanging willy nilly all over the place. It looked so white trash and run down. And I got so many comments from, especially from husbands around the neighborhood. Like, Meredith, what's going on with your lights? I can't see in your lights. Why don't you just let me help you with your lights? Oh, so much shit. So much shit about the lights. And I was really like, at that time, my marriage was really falling apart. So I could, I just could not give less of a shit about the Christmas lights. And finally, like we hired the guy who does our sprinklers and our landscaping to do, to fix some leaking issues we had in the front. And this was last October. And he was like, and so we've known him for over a decade and he's really kind. And he was like, Meredith, go get your ladder. He knew that, that. X was in California. He knew that I was on my own and he knew that I couldn't get up on the roof because I couldn't like fall off the roof. I'm a single mom. You got to have some self-preservation, put the mask on first. He was like, go get your ladder. And he got up and he got my lights off. And so then I had a million questions of, oh, Meredith, what did you do? Who got your lights down? Your lights are finally down. Bah, 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 bah. Fuck off everyone about my Christmas lights. Fuck off. And when someone's house is in disrepair or something's happening or you're walking by and it's not in good shape, it's not because they don't care. It's not because they want it that way. It's not because they're lazy. It's because they are dealing with shit. So either offer to help or keep your mouth shut. Really? I mean, it's not that hard. Either offer to help or keep your mouth shut because they're dealing with shit. So that's my recommendation for a Friday. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. I'm going to hop off here and run to Target before my kids get out of school. So anyway, um, love y'all. Thank you for being here and talk soon. I'll be back probably Monday. All right. Peace out.